Well, thank you, John. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you and grateful to the IISS for once again holding this dialogue and the government of Bahrain for hosting it. Uh, and it's a particular pleasure, may I say, to speak alongside my friend, Nasser Judah. And uh, he will answer all the most difficult questions this afternoon. Uh, we have that to look forward to uh, later on. It is a formidably difficult and sensitive subject that we've been asked to speak about. And the influence of sectarian politics in regional security in the Middle East is a vast and complex subject. Uh, it should really require a deep understanding of the culture and the demography and the politics and the history of the region, as well as all the connections between all of those things. So I approach this subject with some humility, I must say, as someone who's not a citizen of this region, and I'm here to learn as well as to share the perspective of the United Kingdom on these matters. But I am also fundamentally optimistic about human nature and therefore about the future of the Middle East, a region where my country has many deep and mutually beneficial relationships. And though it's hard to imagine uh, all tensions in the region being eliminated, there is nothing inevitable, in my view, about sectarian conflict in the Middle East. Uh, we should reject the idea that democracy in different forms can't take root in Arab nations, or that there is an unbridgeable divide between Sunni and Shia, Catholic and Protestant, or Jew and Muslim. People of different religions, sects, and ethnicities can live together harmoniously within the nation. They have often done so throughout history in this region. And those nations can themselves peacefully coexist with others with different ethnic and religious compositions. The Middle East is not the only region to have experienced sectarian tensions. Interfaith tension and conflict has blighted Europe in the past, and it continues in parts of Asia and Africa today. Indeed, in my country, we endured decades of sectarian conflict in Northern Ireland, which was overcome through a peace agreement that has constantly to be nurtured and upheld. And in my remarks today, I just want to offer four observations about the role of sectarian politics in the Middle East, on which I will welcome your questions and, and comments. My first observation is that we should not make the mistake of viewing the Arab Spring through a sectarian lens. The defining voices of so-called Arab Spring movements have not been religious or sectarian in nature. Instead, from Tunis to Cairo and Damascus, we have heard the voices of people from all walks of life calling for dignity, for economic opportunity, for an end to corruption, for freedom of expression, and for participation in political life. These are legitimate and indeed universal aspirations that transcend nationality, gender, or religion. I'm not starry-eyed about the difficulties of fulfilling these aspirations in countries that have experienced such su sudden political transitions like Egypt, Tunisia, Yemen, and Libya. Reform cannot be achieved overnight. Their governments face an immense task to meet the expectations of their people. Some of them are grappling with severe security challenges. They're all under intense pressure to generate rapid economic benefits for their citizens. And added to this, there are undoubtedly some extremist groups that seek to stir up violence through the exploitation of sectarian and ethnic differences. In the way that we've seen in Lebanon and Iraq over many years, and who may seek to exploit political vulnerabilities in countries in transition. And I'm also conscious of the concerns felt by many citizens in the region about the rise of parties rooted in particular interpretations of Islam, and above all, the impact on women's rights. But democracy is a process, not an event. The test of any government, including new governments in North Africa and the Middle East, is whether they ensure that the rights of citizenship belong to those who don't share their religious or political views, whether they extend the protection of law to all minorities and ensure a full role for women in society, whether they respect the democratic process by not clinging to power if they lose the consent of their people. If they do these things in the countries I've mentioned, the pride and prosperity they fought for in their countries will truly be theirs. Political change will endure if it comes from an inclusive process which allows everyone to have their voice heard. And I urge all parties in Egypt to work through their constitutional debate peacefully and inclusively, allowing enough time and space to debate these 
fundamentally important issues. Those of us outside the region have a responsibility to respect the choices that people make at the ballot box. We should not pick sides or choose winners, but stand up for the right of people to choose their futures and enjoy a full stake in their society. And we shouldn't lose faith in the people of the region, uh, understanding that such change will continue to throw up crises and challenges, and that it will be the work of generations. My second observation is that we should not view sectarian politics as the defining issue affecting the security of the, of the region. Religious belief is only one aspect of identity, and it coexists with other affinities and loyalties that we feel as individuals to our family, to our community, to our nation, and to humanity as a whole. In the same way, sectarian politics are only one aspect of a complicated regional security picture in the Middle East. When we look at the other crucial factors affecting stability, such as interstate rivalry, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the threat of terrorism or nuclear proliferation, it's clear that sectarian politics are not necessarily the determining factor in the security of the region, nor are they the overriding factor in the creation of alliances between Iran and Hamas, or Iran and the Assad regime, for instance, where self-interest overrides sectarian issues. We have to address each of these conflicts and dangers in their own right. We have, for example, to achieve a return to negotiations on a two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict before time runs out. That is why we in the UK are urging the United States to lead a new initiative to restart negotiations urgently, backed by a more active role for European nations. If progress is not made soon, the two-state solution could be made impossible by changes on the ground, including illegal settlement building. We also have to create the conditions for a return to negotiations over Iran's nuclear program through a credible diplomatic offer to Iran and the prospect of increasing sanctions and isolation if talks do not take place and Iran does not take concrete steps to address the concerns of the international community. This is the only way to avert the risk of a military confrontation in the region, which would, could have calamitous consequences. If we don't succeed in these objectives, then 2013 could be a dark year in the Middle East, with a perfect storm of crises converging, including a worsening crisis in Syria. And this leads to my third observation, which is that all countries in the region have a common interest in defusing sectarian tensions and resisting any temptation to inflame them. The dangers of stoking such tensions are all too apparent in Syria. Twenty years ago on European soil, we saw the appalling consequences of ethnic war, when what started as external aggression in Bosnia mutated into internal ethnic conflict, leading to death and displacement on a truly horrific scale. In Syria today, with each week that passes, the wounds inflicted on its society are deeper, the harder it will be to unite different communities, and the greater the risk is of the disintegration of the country. That's why a political transition is desperately needed based on the Geneva principles. This would be a realistic and pragmatic basis for ending the crisis. To be successful, it will require Syrian opposition groups, the National Coalition, to reassure all religious and ethnic communities that their rights will be respected and that they have nothing to fear from a political transition. But it will also need the full engagement of the UN Security Council. And I urge Russia and China again to recognize that President Assad cannot conceivably cling to power or recover legitimacy in the eyes of the country and therefore to work with us and with Special Envoy Brahimi to achieve a political end to the violence. The alternative of drawn-out military conflict would lead to the loss of many more lives. It could lead to a power vacuum in Syria and the collapse of the country, and it would allow new terrorist groups to emerge in the Middle East. We need peacemaking now uh, to avert such consequences in Syria. And in this context, I pay tribute to Jordan, Turkey, Iraq, and Lebanon, who are bearing the brunt of the appalling refugee crisis and call on all nations to give generously to UN relief efforts. My fourth and final observation is that the only way to diffuse and overcome sectarian tensions is by peaceful political means. 
It requires, I would argue, the development of more open societies and economies that reconcile the rights of all with national traditions, with inclusive political systems that allow all groups to participate, and where all communities can be confident that they will have equal access to rights, justice, education, and economic opportunity, regardless of their ethnicity or religion. This suggests um, a move away from political structures that favor the rule of one sect over another and instead are based on a vision of citizenship that makes sect irrelevant and politics based on policy, not identity. We believe that creating the building blocks of open societies, the rule of law, a flourishing civil society, and an independent judiciary and press is the surest way for governments to enjoy legitimacy and consent and for their countries to prosper. But we respect the right of each nation in the region to find its own way in accordance with the grain of their society and of their traditions. Arab nations are sovereign countries, and it's not for the UK or any other country to prescribe ways of changing. There's no one model for in a region with, in, in a region with so many distinct cultures and different political systems. And it's utterly appropriate that reform must be homegrown and for leadership to come from within countries in the region themselves. We welcome the fact that many countries have embarked on peaceful reform programs and encourage them to continue. Entrenching more open societies and economies in the Middle East offers the hope for the greatest expansion of human freedom and opportunity since the end of the Cold War. And the United Kingdom will be a friend and partner to all those engaged in such efforts. We will support countries that have been reborn through revolution but re and respect those changing through evolution. If the path of peaceful change can be taken and we can combine this with resolute action to resolve crises and end bloodshed, there's every hope of avoiding sectarian politics that pit communities against one another and undermine the potential of this great region. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>